Hello? It's good to see you. Every week we start by welcoming all of you who are joining us online and at our different campuses. So we do that today, and I say hello to all of you in the room with me. In about seven years, I think that was the first time they almost missed their cue. Uh, Guys, great to have you here. We are in a series we kicked off last week called Jesus Over Everything. Now, if you think about it, that is a really, really big statement to say Jesus is over everything. Because for Jesus to be over everything means that I have made the choice to give up, surrender, relinquish control of my entire life to him. That's a big deal, right? It's like playing a big game of Simon Says, right? Simon Says, pat your head, and what do you do? Pat your head, right? Simon Says, raise your right arm. You raise your right arm. The challenge is, and you know this is true, that when Jesus says to do something, it's way easier to memorize it and do a five-week Bible study on it than it is to actually do it, right? And so giving up control in real life over real issues, that is a big challenge. Now, we've learned how to do this in limited ways if we see the trade-off, if we see why this has value. So if you're married, you did this when you got married. You gave up a little bit of your freedom, a little bit of your independence in order to have a long-term relationship. Others of you, uh, you do this with a dream you have. You have this dream, you wanna start a business, but you've surrendered it. You've given it up for the trade-off of staying at the job you're at now and having security and having safety of a predictable income. I totally get that. I understand that, right? Uh, For others of us, Uh, we've surrendered, I say we, like I'm included in this, but surrendered the uh, freedom to eat whatever we want and whenever we want in order to have the energy that we desire and feel good, right? And I've actually done a lot of that over the past year. Uh, But in a limited way, we do understand what it is to surrender something with the potential of a payoff on the other end. But last week, As we launched a series, we talked about what it looks like to fully surrender to Jesus and why it's such a difficult thing to do, right? And that's because in our narrow way of thinking, uh, so many of us have come to the conclusion that following Jesus is a losing proposition for us, right? That we're on the really bad end of the deal because we got to give up our freedom and we've got to give up our independence and we've got to give up the idea of living our best life now. When in reality, Jesus promises the exact opposite. Jesus said, when you follow me, I'm gonna give you life and life to the fullest. I'm gonna give you true freedom and true independence. It just looks differently than we've imagined. But in order for us to experience the life God has for us, we need to make the choice that we want Jesus to hold the same place in our life as he does in the universe, that we want him to be the CEO. We want him to be in charge and we want him to call the shots. Which means that when I become aware of what God wants me to do is difficult as it may be, as challenging, as uncomfortable as it may be, I'm saying, hey, I'm going to do it because I believe that is what God wants me to do. And so throughout this series, we're looking at what it really does mean for Jesus to be over everything in our life, our attitudes, our relationships, our finances, our parenting, the way we engage with people on social media, right? The way we respond in stressful situations. And so today what I wanna do is I wanna talk very specifically about what it looks like for Jesus to be over how I see myself. Jesus over my self-perception. Now, I'm not an idiot. I know that sounds boring, right? It just kind of sounds lame, like not all that important. But in the first century, one of the great leaders of the early church, the apostle Paul, he writes a letter and uh, it's to followers of Jesus in Rome. And here's what he says. He says, because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't Think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. Self-perception, how we see ourselves is a really, really big deal. In April of 1995, uh, there was this uh, five foot, six inch, 270 pound man by the name of MacArthur Wheeler who ends up robbing two banks in Pittsburgh on the same day. And in both cases, it was broad daylight and he was not wearing a mask. So as you can imagine, security cameras picked up pretty good images of his face that showed him holding a gun to the teller. Well, that image picked up from a security camera, went out into the nightly news, and because he's not wearing a mask, he's immediately recognized. Tips start coming in, and within an hour of the broadcast, police are on the way to MacArthur's house. Well, they show up, and he is shocked. 
He couldn't believe that they tracked him down. And he made the comment, but I wore the juice. They didn't have a clue what he was talking about. But apparently he had rubbed lemon juice on his face to make it invisible to security cameras. So here's what Wheeler knew. Wheeler knew that lemon juice is used as an invisible ink. And so he concluded, well, if I put it on my face, it would make my face invisible. And so police spend time talking to him. And the crazy thing is they, get, they come to the conclusion the guy's actually not delusional and he's not on drugs. He literally, in his way of thinking, in his logic, believed that his face would be invisible. So he came to the wrong conclusion. Now, not surprisingly, he ends up going to jail. But this crazy story makes its way to a psychology professor at Cornell University who, along with one of his students, uh, are so fascinated by this story they launch into a series of different experiments and they come to the conclusion that every single human being has areas in life in which we're delusional. It's called the Dunning-Kruger effect. It was named after the professor and a student. And in essence, the Dunning-Kruger effect is a type of cognitive bias that we all have in different areas of life in which we believe we are smarter or more capable than we really are. So we all have these areas in which we're delusional. We we think we're better than we really are in those areas. It's why King Solomon of Israel warns us more than 3,000 years ago. Don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Don't think that you know it all. Don't think that you have all the answers. Don't be too proud to listen to others. Don't be too arrogant that you can't learn from other people. Now, throughout history, In almost every culture, it has been determined that if someone has an inflated or exaggerated image of themselves, it is a bad thing uh, for society, right? And the reason why is it can lead to all types of destruction. It can lead to violence. It can lead to crime. It can lead to war. It can lead to all types of destructive behavior because at the core, there is this self-centeredness and this person is just destructive. They feel like they can do whatever they want without a lot of consequences. And that's absolutely true. I mean, we've seen plenty of examples of how pride and arrogance have led to the destruction of relationships and friendships and marriages and workplaces and and even countries. But over the past several decades, and we can probably even say probably the last hundred years, what we've also discovered is that having a deflated image of ourselves, that if we have lives that are characterized by feelings of inadequacy or worthlessness or a lack of self-confidence, that that can also be incredibly destructive because self-centeredness is once again at the core. In other words, I'm the focus. So if I'm arrogant, I'm the focus. But if I have a deflated image, I I just, I'm the focus. I'm always thinking about me. And so as human beings, but very specifically as followers of Jesus, we have to learn to live within the tension of not thinking too highly of ourselves, but also not thinking too low of ourselves either. And we see this with the Apostle Paul. In this letter he writes to Rome, he actually takes some time to reflect on how his life falls short of the mark. It falls short of the life that God intended for him to live. And the conclusion he comes to is this. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? I mean, it's like Eeyore, isn't it? It's just like so depressing. Like, hey, who can free me from this? It is obvious Paul does not have an inflated image of himself. But in the very next chapter, Paul writes these words. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So my life is dominated by wrongdoing. I feel weak, but we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I am strong because of Jesus. Both of these things are simultaneously true. I am weak, but I am strong. And somehow the apostle Paul found a way to live within the tension of not thinking too highly of himself, but also not thinking too little of himself. And the reason that this is such a challenge for every one of us to live within this tension one way or the other is because as humans, we have a limitless capacity for self-deception. Self-deception is when I have an inaccurate view of myself. It's when I don't see what other people see, right? Because it's easy to see this in other people. It's easy for you to see where I'm self-deceived and vice versa. Uh, If you watch American Idol, if you watch The Voice, if you watch America's Got Talent, you know you could be a good judge, right? Because all you need to do is hear someone saying you need to watch their talent and you're like, nope. I know mama told you you were good, but you're not good. 
right? Why is this so easy to see in other people, but, uh, but, we're so, but we can't see it in ourselves? Well, that's because people who don't know, don't know they don't know. People who don't know, don't know that they don't know, right? It's just the way it goes. And just an example of this in my life, uh, uh, years ago, 2008, we were just getting uh, the church started. It was the fall of 2008. And uh, Rindy and I, as we're in the process of launching Great Lakes Church, we know we need to raise funds. We need to raise money to get this thing off the ground. And so uh, we fly to Atlanta to connect with a organization that helps churches financially. They, they invest lots of money into them and uh, uh, they really train you as leaders. Well, there are about 20 uh, couples who were at this particular uh, event by this organization. And we had uh, several days of meetings and interviews and they're doing assessments and personality tests on us to see, hey, are you uh, worth the investment we're gonna make into your church? Well, at the end of the, 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 the week, where we had been doing all these meetings, there was one couple who did not receive the stamp of approval, the thumbs up and the funding needed to start the church. Any guesses who that was? That was me and Rindy. And uh, I got to tell you, it was defeating. And so with my personality, I'm pretty straightforward. I just said to the person who told me it wasn't going to happen, I just said, um, uh, I, I just need to know why. Like, I, I can accept the no, but just tell me why. And they just said, hey, Dave, we're just going to be honest with you. You're a little over the top for this organization, and uh, you are a little bit different than the other churches and all the pastors that we had in there. And I just, I said, well, just give me an example. I, I'll be honest with you. I'm not following what you're saying. They said, okay, just example. They said, when we asked every pastor to uh, stand up and talk a little bit about the church and introduce their wife, everybody did that. But when you stood up, your words were, I'm going to tell you about the church, but uh, if you don't want to hear about my church, you can just look at my wife. Here's a little eye candy for you. I say, well, I mean, I thought it was pretty funny, uh, you know? And... Uh, I, I said, really, that's it? They said, well, there's another example. They said, we asked people to role play. Uh, what would happen if their next door neighbor came over and stand in the driveway and said, I just feel empty inside and I just feel like I'm missing something in life. Uh, how would you take a conversation from there and, and, and kind of bring it toward Jesus? And they said, and everybody stood up and they talked about how they would do that. But when you stood up, you said, uh, I have a lot of friends who don't know Jesus and there's not a chance they would ever bring up a conversation like that that way. I said, but it's true. I said, that's not how people talk. They just said, Dave, we're not, we're not, it's just, and here's the thing, I totally thought I had killed it. If you'd say, man, Dave, are you gonna get the money? I'm like, yes. Total self-deception, right? But at some level, we're all self-deceived. And sometimes that leads to us thinking too highly of ourselves. We become fiercely independent. And when we're fiercely independent, we keep God and others at a distance. This is why King David of Israel writes, in his pride, the wicked man does not seek him. In all his thoughts, there is no room for God. Isn't it true that when we're proud, that when we think we know best, when we have the answers, when we've already determined in our heart that we're gonna do whatever we wanna do, isn't it true that we keep God and others at a distance? I don't want God's input or direction because I've already made up my mind. Now on the flip side, when I have a deflated image of myself, when I think too low of myself, the end result is still the same. I keep God and others at a distance because I convince myself that I am unlovable. I conclude that I have nothing to offer or I am insignificant. This is why Paul challenges his readers in the verse we read earlier, don't think you are better than you really are. And we could add, or worse, be honest in your evaluation of yourselves. As a follower of Jesus, it's just critically important that we have an accurate view of ourselves. And so what I wanna do is spend the rest of the time to, that we have today talking about the different factors that make up our life and influence how we see ourselves. Rick Warren is a pastor of a church in California, Saddleback uh, Church. And Rick talks about how in life, each of us are handed five different cards. I wanna walk through those cards today. The first card is the chemistry card. The chemistry card, right? This is our chemical makeup. This is our biology. It's our DNA. It's at the very most basic levels, what makes us uh, who we are. And you know this, we're all very, very different. Some of you, you were born with a hypersensitivity to pain, right? So you can be in the lobby and somebody brush up against you. It's just like, ah, and the rest of the day, you're just kind of nursing your arm, right? Some people are like that. Other people, uh, they have a high tolerance for pain. They could fly down, you know, fall down a flight of stairs and they just kind of get up. They may be limping the rest of the day, but eh, no big deal. 
Right? We're just, we're built differently. Some of you were born with a low energy level. A high, right? Then there's other people, it's just like off the charts, energy levels, like Tigger, every time you see them, you know, it's just like, and, and not a right or wrong. Some of you, you're like my wife, you're incredibly calm and laid back, right? The house could be on fire, but you want to finish watching the movie. Right? And then others of you are like me, you got some anxiety. You see a candle burning, you're like, ah, we should probably put that thing out. <laughs> Not a right or wrong, right? Just the way we are born. So King David of Israel, he writes this about biology. He says, God, thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. Now I know not everybody feels that way about their bodies because we all know that our bodies are flawed and we have things we wanna change. We all have biological and chemical deficiencies and those deficiencies result in emotional problems, physical problems, mental problems. But here's the deal, whatever your problem is, we all have problems, just at different levels. And regardless of what your problem is, I want you to know that the flaws in the makeup of your body, those things that you would change about yourself today, they're not sinful or shameful. We're just all broken. And so the very first card that we're dealt with, uh, that we're dealt in life is our chemistry, our biology and our our body. And here's the thing about our health. Whatever our health looks like, whatever our body is, we have the responsibility to take care of it as best as we can and to make the most of the chemistry card. Then there is a second card that we are dealt in life, and that is our connections, right? These are our relationships. You and I are the product of relationships in our life. And here's the deal. The most critical relationships are the ones we don't get to choose because they're the ones that happen early on in our life our parents, our grandparents, our aunts and uncles, our siblings, our teachers, our pastor, whoever that is early on in your life that you don't get to choose, they form your life for the good or bad. And study after study has shown that our identity and self-image is shaped by the people who are most important to us growing up. That's because relationships are what give life meaning and purpose and identity. So Bronnie Ware is an Australian nurse who has spent significant amounts of time with people who are dying. Uh, specifically in the last three to 12 weeks of their life. Well, she ended up writing a book years ago about the themes that surfaced in conversations with those who knew the end was near. And the book is called The Top Five Regrets of the Dying. And in essence, what the book reveals is what so many of us already know, that when people spend their life focusing on accomplishments and achievements and building wealth and popularity and power and prestige, uh, what ends up happening is they regret it. In fact, the number two regret is, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. But what's most fascinating to me about this book and this study is that the author uh, says the number one regret of those who are dying, right at the top of the list, was this regret. I wish I had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. Number one regret. So in essence, people said, so many of the decisions that I made in life were made out of guilt or pressure or shame from other people. Who we're connected to is a big deal. The relationships in our life are important. And if we have an inflated image of ourselves or a deflated image of ourselves, it's gonna be destructive to the relationships because in either case, we're gonna be self-centered. We're thinking about ourselves all the time. It's either gonna be poor me, poor me, poor me, or it's gonna be up here of just saying, you should do what I'm telling you to do because I'm large and in charge. In either case, we feel this need to prove ourselves. But if we can learn to live in the tension, if we can learn to live in the middle, not thinking too high, not thinking too little, we can live with confidence because then we have nothing to prove, right? We can can approach uh, the relationships in our life and in the different settings we walk into, we can just approach it with this confidence and have the question like, how can I be a blessing to you? How can I help? How can I affirm today? How can I encourage you today? Because in our hearts, we're already confident. The focus doesn't have to be on us having an accurate view of ourself, not too high, not too low, right, is very, very freeing. Recently, I spent uh, some time with a guy who is incredibly successful, uh, one of the most successful individuals that I've met and uh, really, really admire him. And I was shocked, not just by how he allowed me to interact with him and talk with him because uh, we actually, uh, it was in a small group setting uh, with uh, a few different guys and we got to spend several days with this individual. Um, I was just blown away at how approachable he was. And so I just said, hey, let's just call it, you know, call it out. You're incredibly successful. 
I said, I've read your books, I've, you know, seen, but I said, I am shocked at how humble and approachable you are. I said, what do you give credit to? And he says, I don't know. He says, I, I will tell you this. The model for my life that has driven me since my early 20s is this. It's gonna come on the screen right now. He says, I have nothing to prove and no one to impress. Think of how freeing that is, right? When it comes to connections, just imagine if you could live within the balance, not thinking too high, not thinking too little, but if you just said, I have nothing to prove and no one to impress. Well, there is a third card uh, that we are uh, dealt in life and uh, that is the circumstances in our life. Right? Our circumstances are things that happen to us, things that happen around us that shape our identity. And some of the circumstances in our life are really, really good. They build self-esteem. They build confidence in us. But as you know, others are not so good. And those things shape us as well. Problems shape us. Pain shapes us. Pressures shape us. If you've ever been sexually abused, emotionally abused, physically abused, it's affected you if you've experienced rejection or loss or major failure, if you've experienced a crisis of some sort, which we all have, it's shaped us. And I want you to know, you may be the product of a painful past, but you do not have to be prisoner of it. The apostle Paul, he writes very candidly about something in his life that he wanted to experience freedom and healing from. We don't know what it was. He doesn't tell us exactly what it is, but he does say, God did not heal me and God did not free me. Here's what he writes. He says, three different times, I begged the Lord to take it away. So this must have been three different seasons of complete, because it wasn't probably just three times, please take it away, please take it away. But it was like three different scenarios where he looks back and says, man, I was intense. God, take it away. Each time I said, uh, he said, God responded, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. God can take the garbage that we want to throw away and make something amazing from it. There's a form of art that exists in our world called trash art. And it's exactly what it sounds like. It's art composed from trash and things that have been thrown away. And I first learned about this in a documentary years ago called Wasteland, in which an artist took trash from the world's largest garbage dump in Rio de Janeiro and made something from it. So I'm just gonna show you a piece of art that he made from it, right? It's this individual uh, laying back, and it's hard to really get a picture of it. So let me step back here and show you from the balcony how large this is. But this is all trash taken from the garbage dump. This is what God does with our lives when we surrender to him. Because part of surrendering is saying, God, I've got this pain. I've got this hurt. I've been betrayed. I've gone through this loss. I had this happen to me. But because of who you are, I'm gonna follow you and trust you. That might be, I'm going down the path of forgiveness. It might be, I'm going down the path of just saying, God, I wanna extend mercy. God, I want to show compassion. That I didn't feel compassion, but I wanna show compassion. God, I wanna do for someone what was not done to me. Whatever that is, where we're just saying, God, I'm choosing to obey you. I'm surrendering to you. Our, our attitude is, God, I believe you can take the pain in my life, not necessarily erase it, but use it for something good. So when it comes to our circumstances, whether good or bad, the question all of us ought to be asking is, how can I leverage what I've been through to help others? Now, to be clear, I'm not asking you to put a Jesus Band-Aid on your pain, right? I'm not asking you to act like, you know, it's a good thing you have pain and good thing you went through what you went through. And you, I'm really excited about the abuse because now it can be used in a good way. I'm not asking you to pretend in any way. I'm simply telling you, God can use the pain in your life and he can bring beauty from ashes. I mean, think about it. Who better to help an alcoholic than someone who has struggled with alcoholism, right? Who, who better to help someone dealing with the pain of abuse than someone who's experienced that themselves? Who better to help someone going through the loss of a loved one than someone who has been there themselves? The Apostle Paul writes about the difficult circumstances we go through in life and says this, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is a, our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. He comforts us in all our troubles. Why? So that we can comfort others. In other words, those things we see as weaknesses, the things that we see as loss, the things we wanna throw away, hey, God can use that when we live a life surrendered to him. Well, there's a fourth card that we are dealt in life. 
right? And that is the card of consciousness. Got to stay with the C's here, right? Consciousness is how I think. There's a lot in our world that's shaped our thinking. Media has shaped our thinking. Parents have shaped our thinking. Teachers, culture, all of that has shaped our thinking. And the way that I think results in how I feel. But what I want to remind you today is that feelings are not facts. So based on things you've heard, maybe you've gotten to a point where you say, I feel unattractive. Doesn't mean you are. I feel unloved. I feel insignificant. Doesn't mean you are. Feelings are not facts. Now on the flip side, when maybe you have this inflated view of yourself, maybe you realize I, I've got an issue in life that needs to be addressed and your whole attitude is, I can fix it myself. I, I've, my whole life, I've done things for myself. I don't need other people. Feelings aren't facts. Feelings aren't facts. But how we think shapes us. And if we don't learn to manage our thoughts, we can end up with an inflated or deflated view of ourselves and neither is healthy. And then there is a fifth card. And it's a very important card because it shapes and controls the other cards. It's the card of choices. Right, the Bible says we were created in the image of God. Animals were not created in the image of God. Insects were not created in the image of God. Lord knows mosquitoes were not created in the image of God, right? But humans are. And that means lots of different things and has lots of implications. One of the implications is that as humans, we have a free will and we have the ability to make moral choices. Animals living out in the water, are wild, insects flying around, they have instincts. They can make a choice in the moment, but they're not making moral or ethical decisions. You and I have the ability to choose, and that's because we are made in God's image. And every single day, there are gonna be, uh, we're gonna be handed a card of choices. We're gonna be making choices every single day. And some choices are gonna be really, really tough. And the freedom to choose can be the greatest blessing in our life, but you know it, it can also be the greatest curse. So many of the regrets we have in life, so many of the pain and the problems we have in life are because of the decisions that we made or that someone else made. And so our choices, the ability to choose can be a blessing or a curse. The good thing is if you have a history of making bad decisions and going down the wrong path, you can start making good decisions and going in a different direction. But here's what I want you to hear. We've all been dealt different cards in life. And those cards have resulted in wins and losses and in what we would categorize as weaknesses and strengths. The cards we've been dealt have impacted our personality and our temperament. They've made us who we are, right? And so the bottom line is every single one of us have weaknesses and strengths that have shaped us, that, that have made us who we are. The challenge for us is identifying those weaknesses and those strengths embracing them so we have an accurate view of ourselves. So I've talked before about how I have taken many, many different personality tests. My favorite test by far for personality tests is the Enneagram test. Uh, to me, it's the most accurate. Uh, there are nine personality types. You are primarily one type, but then you also have a wing, which means you can gravitate. So I am a, uh, uh, an eight Enneagram with a seven wing, okay? So what does that mean? That means when I'm healthy, my strengths, right? I'm generous, courageous, protective of others, empathetic, and inspirational. I am an angel from the heavenly realm. <laughs> I've been operating out of a healthiness for a long time, ladies and gentlemen, right? But when I am unhealthy, and I'm telling you, th this is the most accurate test I've seen of me. I am ruthless, hard-hearted, confrontational, vengeful, and dictatorial. There's a little bit of Satan in me somewhere, right? But here's the deal, you have weaknesses too. Maybe your weakness is you avoid conflict at all costs or you're self-critical or you're overly sensitive or you're way too blunt or you're impulsive. When it comes to our weaknesses, the tendency is we deny them, we cover them up, we protect them, we excuse them, we resent them. We don't want anybody to know about them. But I want you to know that God allows us to go through difficulty in life and he allows us to have weaknesses in life because he's not impressed with self-sufficiency. And our weaknesses are a reminder that we need God and others. Think about this. Our strengths create competition, but our weaknesses create community. Our weaknesses, man, they reveal, hey, I need other people that keep us dependent on God, 
But our strengths, they create competition. So I walk into a setting and if I look around and feel like I'm better than everyone else in this room at this particular thing, I kind of get pleasure in that. That brings me joy. But if I walk into another setting and I realize, oh, wow, I thought I was really good at that, but these people are better than me. Now all of a sudden I lose that joy. I feel defeated. Our strengths are not meant to create competition. They're meant to help others and bless others. We're gonna talk about that next week, but do not miss this. Every single human being is irreplaceably significant. All the different factors that make you who you are have created someone who's unique, someone who's irreplaceable. And with all of our strengths and weaknesses, the things we love about ourselves and the things we wish could change tomorrow, the apostle Paul comes to this conclusion. He says, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. You are a masterpiece. So don't think you're better than you really are or worse. Be honest in your evaluation of yourself. Let me close with this. A few years ago, my friend Marcus Jones wrote a book called Holding Hands with Grace. And in the first chapter, he writes about the day that his wife gave birth to their very first child and how excited he was. He says, all I could do was stand there and try to choke my heart back into place. The orchestra played the Ascellorendo. The moment was here. And then she came, Addison Grace Jones, made her long-awaited entrance to the world. Now just hold this picture right here. Added Grace. This, he says, was the thrill of victory. This was the moment every father dreams of. This was the pinnacle. And then the music suddenly stopped. All the oxygen sucked out of the room. There was something wrong with Addie. Doctors and nurses flew into action. Alarms and codes rang out across the maternity ward. He says, tests were proposed. Flurry of scans followed. And within minutes came the results. Her insides weren't connected properly. She wouldn't survive without surgery. The doctor gave me the verdict and he might as well punch me in the stomach. I vomited right there on the spot. Then he talks about the following days in the surgery and how difficult it was. And then he said, they gave us another diagnosis. Addison had Down syndrome. And Marcus says, I said to the doctor after all these emotions going through me, how am I gonna be able to do this when she's 40? I can't do this. And in that instant, the doctor locked eyes with me her face warmed and she uttered one of the most profound sentences anyone had ever said to me. You'll be a different man when she's 40, Mr. Jones. And he gets to the end of the book and he says the decision to hold hands with grace was really two different decisions. One has been a marvelous transformative walk with a little girl named Addie who taught me what really matters in life. She arrived amidst a fanfare of pain, but she's become my pride and joy. The other has been a marvelous transformative walk with Jesus Christ, in whom I found life and abundance and hope, I have become his pride and joy. We don't like it in life when we feel like we've lost, when we're confused, when we feel weak, when we feel inadequate. But if you want to have a transformative experience with Jesus, you have to surrender your dreams and your ideals and what you consider your strengths and your weaknesses, the good and the bad, and live with this prayer, God, I surrender my life to you. Do whatever you choose in my life and through my life. I'm yours. And Heavenly Father, when I become aware of what you want me to do, even if it's in conflict with what I naturally do, even if it's in conflict with what I like, I trust you. And I will choose to follow and obey you regardless of the results. And I can tell you, you know, Marcus was told, hey, you'll be a different man for in, in 40 years when, when Addie's 40. It hasn't been 40 years but he's already a different man. Because I went on his Facebook page this week. She's 17, right? And he says she impacts every life she touches. She's utterly remarkable. He said, I had no idea 17 years ago today. He said, I was blindsided by confusion and fear. I grieved expectations about a life I thought would be forever broken. I thought I knew, and yet God knew so much more. And he says, on days like today, days meant for celebrating and appreciating and reflecting on the joy of precious life, I am profoundly grateful for Addison Grace and to my God who's been faithful to see us through and deliver a gift that has changed my world so profoundly for the good. This is what happens when you live a life surrendered to Jesus. Because in the lowest moments of his life, 
Marcus and his wife, Jen, they continue to love Jesus, follow Jesus, serve Jesus. And what they thought was a life gonna be filled with ashes God has brought beauty from. And if you said, hey, would you get in a time machine, go back and have a healthy child the way you envision it, they would not give up Addison Grace. If we embrace both the good and the bad, the strengths and the weaknesses, God will help us live in the tension of not thinking too highly of ourselves or too little. And so I know I'm broken, but God says I'm whole. And I know I'm a failure or I fail, but God says I'm victorious. And I definitely have fears, but God says I'm courageous. And I feel really ordinary, but God says I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. And I know I'm weak, but God says I am strong. And if Jesus truly is over everything in my life, it means I have to begin to see myself as he sees me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, please open our eyes so we can see ourselves like you see us. We submit our strengths and weaknesses to you. Help us to not think too highly of ourselves or too little of ourselves. Do in us and through us whatever you choose to do in Jesus' name. Amen.